All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Emma, one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we are so pleased to be hosting tonight's speaker. Um, I'm happy to turn it right over to tonight's presenter. Marie McNeely is Director of Partnerships at the Georgia's River Land Trust. Her background includes a 20 plus career, year career leading global advertising and marketing efforts at New York City ad agencies. For the past five years, she's been a consultant for nonprofits in Boston and Washington, DC, and she lives in Owl's Head. And I will turn it right over to Marie and you can go right ahead. Thank you, Em. Hello everyone on Zoom and in the community room. Thanks for coming tonight. And a big thank you, first of all, to M. Lewis and to the Rockland Public Library for inviting me to be part of your adult programming series. Um, I'm sure everyone there definitely agrees that the Rockland Public Library is an incredible resource. You know, the staff and librarians, um, they just work so diligently behind the scenes to figure out what programs can benefit this community. And uh, so, so I aim to please uh, tonight with the story of Rockland's biggest, oldest ecological secret. Uh, the peat bog known as the Oyster River Bog or colloquially well known as the Rockland Bog. So um, let me just jump here. Tonight's talk then, um, I'm going to be, uh, you'll learn about what a peat bog is and where the bog, Rockland Bog actually is for those who don't, haven't spent their youth in it. Um, what's special about it, um, why we should conserve it. And if you're interested in our conservation effort, um, how you personally can make a difference. So let me start with a little peat bog one-on-one. -on -one. Um, a peat bog is a type of wetland characterized by spongy ground composed of living and decaying moss. And when moss dies in this ground, it's trapped in water and it can't decompose. So it piles up in layers and over the years, thousands of years actually, um, the layers of moss compact and form what we call peat. And uh, the, the picture in your head probably of peat is uh, people digging in Irish movies, you know, those big bricks of brown. Uh, but I, I, the, the picture that uh, what you don't normally see is uh, the star of the of the peat moss, the sphagnum mosses. There are the, they are the sponge bobs of the peat bogs. They hold 26 times their water, their weight in water, um, and they help keep the bogs soggy. And they even prevent flooding. But more about that, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So on drier ground, um, dead plants rot and they decompose and they send carbon back into the soil or into the atmosphere. But a peat, but a peat land is so soggy that even the deadest shrub can't decompose. So its carbon stays underground and out of the atmosphere. And peat bogs are, peat bogs are kind of, um, they're kind of a big preservation tank. Um, anything that falls into a peat bog and stays in that soggy, spongy place uh, can't decompose, and it stays preserved for a very long time, like 2,000-year-old lumps of butter or a 4,700-year-old wheel um, or a 10,500-year-old 10, 10, canoe or even this guy, a Danish man from the fifth century, all those things have been found in bogs. Um, by the way, the Danish man uh, is known as Tallinn Man, and you can actually go see him in the Silkborg Museum in Denmark. I think this is an, ex but I think he particularly is an exquisite example 
of how well a bog prevents decomposition. Now, for years, we've heard um, a lot about the power of trees uh, as a natural solution to the threat of climate change. And by now, you've all heard that by preventing the clear cutting of the Amazon rainforest, we've, we're protecting the lungs of the earth. And all of that is true. Who doesn't love a tree, especially in Maine? They're majestic and they command respect. Um, but excuse the pun, but bogs are bogged down with a lot of negative folklore. They're the place of, through the years that you've heard of bog bodies and ghosts and mythical spooks and robbers that need a hiding place. So peatland, peatlands don't get a, peatlands and bogs don't get a really good reputation, but Frankly, they're the unsung heroes of carbon capture. They are only beginning to gain awareness as a powerful, very powerful climate solution. Peatlands are, in fact, um, one of the best of the one of the planet's best carbon sinks. They make up three percent of the land on Earth um, and store twice as much carbon as all the world's forests combined. So that's why we're, um, we have to really pay attention to peatlands. They've taken a long time to form and they can be destroyed in a generation. Uh, peatlands in Indonesia were drained and turned into palm oil plantations. 12% of Canada is peatland and it's been drained to build mines and roads and hydroelectric dams. So think about the Think, think about all that carbon stored safely underground for 7,000 years um, and then getting drained. Uh, it turns out um, that we've drained 15% of the world's peatlands. So if you think about peatlands getting drained, what happens is that our unsung hero um, turns into a uh, a, a villain. Uh, it, a carbon sink becomes a, a carbon spewer. Um, drain peatlands can admit, emit 2 billion tons of accumulated carbon every year. And as the planet warms and peatlands dry up, they catch fire and they burn and they burn. So um, draining peatlands is not something that we want to do anymore. Um, extracting peat also releases huge amounts of CO2, and that also contributes to uh, climate change. And extracting peat uh, is used in gardening to help plants and seedlings grow. Many of you gardeners out there might know about peat moss or using peat to help your garden grow. But spreading it on a field or a garden quickly turns it into CO2 and it adds to um, greenhouse gas levels. So peat extraction actually is expected to be a $12 billion industry by 2027. I don't think COVID helped that. It, it spawned a lot of gar uh, gardeners. Um, some argue that peat's a renewable resource, but it's much harder to restore. In fact, it's, it's just much harder to restore a peat bog than to replant a forest. So there is a new movement underfoot to, to do peat-free gardening, uh, to stop extracting it. By 2024, in fact, peat sales to gardeners in the UK will be banned. Uh, the long and short of it uh, is that the planet would be better off if we just left peat bogs and peat lands alone. And that's really the heart of that movement. But I wanted to give you that background before I talk specifically about the Rockland bog so you have a sense of uh, how important and again, how unsung peat lands are. So let's talk about the Rockland bog now. Um, it's the largest peat land in Midcoast, Maine. Um, where exactly is it? Uh, it's located primarily in 
Rockland. 60% of it's in Rockland, but it's also in Warren and Thomaston and Rockport. Um, so that territory in green on this map is, is a, where the Rockland bog is. It's a 700 acre pea bog and it has over 5,000 acres of surrounding woodlands, roughly the size of Camden Hill State Park. It's low laying with an upland forest uh, surrounding the peatland. And in 10,000 years ago, a glacier receded and carved out the contour of this bog. So the sea advanced and it gave it a floor of marine clay. And then the plant life deposited and compacted in this process that I mentioned earlier, forming peat. So peat in the bog is roughly 10 feet deep uh, and it ranges to 20 feet deep in the southern part of the bog. So what's so special about the Rockland bog? Well, from our perspective, the Georges River Land Trust perspective, uh, we consider it a community gem. And you know, just, just so that you know who the Georges River Land Trust is, we spend our efforts conserving the ecosystems and protecting the heritage of the lands, 225 square miles of land in the Georges River watershed. So that's from north, the headwaters up near Montville, all the way to where the Georges River empties out um, in the Muscongas Bay <clears throat> between the towns of Port Clyde and Cushing. So we look at the bog as this mosaic of uplands and wetlands and woodlots and woodlands in various stages. Uh, there, there are mature forests there, there's special habitats, there's cultural remnants, sites, foot trails, degraded logging trails with several waterways flowing through it. It's very, very rich in history and um, very rich in what it can do for um, the environment. It's a habitat of hundreds and hundreds of plant species. And because so much of the bog has large parcels of undeveloped land, it provides wildlife corridors for the movement of animals and bird species. It provides carbon sequestr sequestration that mitigates climate risk, like I just told you. Um, and also it provides flood mitigation, 25 square miles drain into the bog. And um, that's a really valuable thing as we face rising seas and warming planet. Uh, people were, just a little bit about uh, the cultural history of the bog, people were attracted to the Rockland bog and its surrounding areas hundreds of years ago because its natural resources were so rich. It was the source of water, it, rich soils, timber, and game. The first, the Penobscot Nation was, it, were its first summer residents, and they set up their birch bark covered wigwams and came to collect food for the winter. Uh, and then the Euro European settlers followed and they set up permanent residence, inevitably changing the landscape as they harvested timber and they built roads and they dammed the Oyster River to support their grain and their sawmills. And then among the first settlers, that's a, gra that's a gravestone of Isaiah Tolman, who was one of the first to settle near the bog in 1765. He had 21 children. They were dependent on the natural resources of the bog for their life, livelihood. Nine generations of Tolmans carried forward stories of life in the bog. They've ad advocated for its conservation. Other, other names from old settlers, you've heard names like Blake and Keen. There's wonderful stories of uh, available for what life was like for those first um, European settlers or American settlers in the bog. One of my favorite stories though is Clarissa Tolman married a seafaring man named Samuel Ezra Kellogg, and they reportedly toasted cornflakes in the family kitchen. And then they moved to Battle Creek, Michigan and started a manufacturing business. But I like to think um, 
that the Kellogg's cornflake probably should have been called Clarissa's cornflakes. Uh, Cause I'm sure that most likely Chris, Clarissa was the one in the kitchen. Um, anyway, today the bog is, um, oh, let me tell you a little bit about the, the um, plants in the bog. It's, it's a favorite of the naturalists who have gone in there. It's, in, it's full of nutrient rich plants and it's, a, it's soils and it's topography and it's geology and the kind of the cool microclimate of the bog um, create the conditions for over 300 plant species. Plant species. In fact, 25% of all the species, plant species in Maine are in the bog. So plants like pitcher plant and rose purple and dragon mouth orchid and lambskill, Labrador tea, very interesting um, plants. Though, you know, so it, again, imagine those, those, that soggy, con those soggy conditions allow a lot of rich nutrients to flow to those plants. So the bog is also home to um, amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals and invertebrates, invertebrates, um, deer and snowshoe hares win winter there and they provide a sustenance for hunters over the years. You can find wading birds and waterfowl and a very rare pond dam damselfly called the citrine forktail um, damselfly. So the bog has been a favorite spot over the years too for outdoor recreation. Uh, it's, and this is key for those who know about it. Um, it's an inside secret. A lot of people don't know about it because they can't access the bog. bog. But um, anyway, through these handshake agreements, um, we've managed, for instance, the connection from Rockport to Thomaston um, on a signature trail of ours called the Georges Highland Path. We've, we've negotiated agreements and had that path in there since two, the year 2000. But it's also a big favorite of mountain bikers and cross-country skiers. Um, the trouble is uh, the, unauth the unauthorized use of the bog, the people that have not made those agreements with landowners, um, particularly among a ATVs that are degrading some of the old logging trails. Um, but it is a, a, a kind of a really interesting, huge, undeveloped park on some parts uh, of, of the bog. So the vision we have um, after talking to a lot of um, community members is over the years to work with others in the community to offer more public access to the bog with a trail system that won't upset the sensitive parts of its ecosystem and that can use some of the trails that are there and degraded but um, we could uh, make them more accessible and upgrade them. So the reasons to conserve and protect the Rockland bog are pretty numerous. It, as I said, it's an overlooked climate solution right in our backyard. It offers this ancient, vast, incredibly vast sink for carbon. And again, underappreciated. Um, it protects biodiversity and rare species of plants and invertebrates. And it's a climate refuge for these species um, that need to travel as the planet warms. It, it mitigates flood risks. Um, and, and frankly, another way to think about it is it's just a big petri dish for monitoring the ecosystem that can teach us a lot about climate change. It has that advantage too. So we're big fans. <laughs> um, what you can do, you have an opportunity to participate in conserving the Rockland Bog by working together with us. And this is my commercial, um, admittedly. Right now, we're looking to increase the protected wilderness in the bog by 50%, 517 acres permanently. Uh, we're working to acquire it and take care of those 517 acres. We've been awarded a generous grant to make that happen, but we need to raise another $150,000 to do it. 
And so we are on a campaign to involve other people in the community. You can help us by making a donation or pledging a multi-year gift to uh, ensure public access for generations to come. And so for those in the community room, there is, M has some handouts, I think, to give you a, a, a way to do that. And for anyone on Zoom, if you're interested in participating, please just contact me at the George's River Land, Land Trust by calling the number on this screen, 594-5166, and we'd welcome your participation. But Em, I'm ready to take any questions people have. All right, there we go, I'm unmuted. All right, so anyone either here or via Zoom, if you have questions, feel free to shoot away and we'll, we'll, we'll handle those as they come. Yes. Uh, I actually live on Bog Road, uh, Marie, and um, over the last six months, the city of Rockland has put in a small, tiny parking lot, like an eight-space parking lot on the foot of the southern end of Bog Road before Mountain Road. It doesn't appear to be access to a trail from there, which was my original understanding of it. Are you familiar with that? Am I familiar with the parking spot and the trail? Yeah, and is that is that connected to a trailhead or? It is connected to a small um, trail off that parking lot to allow you. It's a very short, accessible walk um, that a lovely group of volunteers put together so that you could actually go in, park your car, take that short walk, and actually have a pretty good this have, have a pretty good look at the size of the bog. I have one via Zoom. Um, Shelly asks, would you give an update on the new trail off Bog Road? I think that's the one I'm talking about. Same one, okay. Yeah. It needs a couple of bridges. It needs a couple of bridges. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Yes. But there's a lot of work that has to be done in there that we have not even begun. There's a, it's, it's tremendous. Um, it, it's Rockland's own forest. It could, it could be an incredible network of trails, but uh, that, that we're, we're busy doing some more conservation work of the, this large scale work before that happens. Anyway. My, my question is, is the land trust looking to buy land owned by the city of Rockland in the bar? Uh, owned by the city of Rockland. We are not looking to buy land from the city of Rockland. Um, the, the work that we're doing, the 517 acres that I referenced is a private landowner. And there's, you know, it's it's the bog, for those of you in the room that know about it, it's a series of private, mostly private landowners in there. And it's owned by some conservancies. It's owned by um, the Oyster River uh, Conservancy has done a beautiful work and they own property in there too, land in there too. Um, but no, we're not looking to buy anything from the city of Rockland. As a follow up to that question, um, you mentioned the other the Oyster River group in the city of Rockland. You know, will there be an attempt to sort of consolidate the bog under one conservation effort, one group? I'm sorry, Em, I can't. Sure, you. sure. Um, so you're asking um, if is there going to be an effort to um, sort of consolidate the two groups into sort of one group that's just like one group that's working to conserve the bog? Uh, no, there, there isn't at this time, no. I mean, I, I think there is, there is so much land in the bog. What we are trying to do is consolidate parcels so that you know there is a tremendous amount of conserved land in the bog already. We're just trying to add to the cons conserved land that is already there. Are there any private landowners that don't want you walking in their area? And is it posted at all? I've uh, been to the bog many times, but I've never seen any postings, but things change. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. It's, 
there is a lot of confusing signage and uh, created by many people. There's a mess of, of um, it, it, my, my colleague Annette Nagel from Georgia River Land Trust likes to say, it's the wild west in there. Mm -hmm. um, some people, uh, you, don't, some, some, you don't even know where you are at times. So um, to answer your question, it's not, things aren't, um, there isn't a system of markings. Very relatedly, um, Shelly asks in the chat, um, would you consider publishing a trail map for the VOG in the future? There's a bit of a mess of markings and uses so that it's difficult to <laughs> play at present. Well, that was a good segue. Um, uh, I, we don't, there, there's so much land in the bog, but yes, the, the intention would be over time that there would be, uh, you know, the objective really is two things. One is to preserve the ec ecosystem and protect it so that it's not harmed. And as I said, there's a lot of that ecosystems in the bog that's very sensitive and you don't wanna have trails or people walk there. But there's a lot of existing trails that can be upgraded and marked so that the second objective is to make that clearer so people can have access to the bog and seeing see it. I mean, apart from some folks that um, I heard earlier that had grown up or they've been in the bog. There's a lot of people that don't know where it is or how to get into it or because because it's because of the lack of of um, kind of a system of the, it's a secret for these for these bikers and all those folks that have been using it over the years, but to try to make it more public is, is an objective. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you tell us about the role of methane in bogs and, and methanogenesis? I, I'm sorry, the question? Uh, can you talk about the role of methane in bogs? Um, I am not a, 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 an environmental scientist, but I would, I would say that if you, what I was, suggesting or talking about before is when bogs are drained or extracted, then methane and carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases come up from the bog. But I can't talk to you about the detail of that science. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to find out for you if you leave your name. Go ahead. Uh, years ago, when I was wandering around the bog, there were a lot of moose in there, are there still? There was a lot of moose. Moose. Are they still there? Are they? Um, they are there. There's a lot of deer in there. Um, I don't know how many. Uh, the last study I looked at was from 2002, and uh, it was that group tracked a lot of animals. Um, moose was noted, but not not a lot. Someone, go ahead. Do bogs serve to clean or purify the, the water that finds its way into them? Do bogs serve to clean or purify the water that finds its way into them? Yes. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. Hmm. Purify the water, I don't, I don't think so, but I... I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we've got an answer. Um, any wetland system that's part of a wetland function is that by, by acting as a sponge and acting as a filter, it both um, decreases sedimentation, it helps to filter and take out impurities, and it helps to recover. Those are basic functions of any wetland system. Some do it better than others, but all the tempers are getting more freedom. Excellent. Yes, go ahead. Where in the world is peat moss primarily uh, harvested? Is it in Canada or the US or in Europe or where is it? Russia? Um, Northern, well, drained 
it's primarily in Canada and Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Extracted, uh, it's, it's been extracted, it's uh, close to a $12 billion industry of extraction. So it's been in North America and in Europe. But as I mentioned, a lot of that is being banned in Northern Europe, particularly in the UK. Is there any movement to ban it in the United States in dark, being sold? I don't know that. Um, there has been talk that I've read, but I don't know if there's legislation. Um, I think it's a matter of time that people, I think peatland preservation is going to be the next um, rainforest awareness. Any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat, but any last questions or comments from real life people too? Can I ask a yeah, go for it. Um, of people who are in the audience, that would sit here, it would be great to hear some of your stories of your um, experiences there because part of our conservation in the bog is to not just preserve the ecology, but some of the rich history that's there. I think that'll do it for tonight. Thanks so much to everyone for joining, both in Zoom and in person. And thanks so much to Marie. That was a really fantastic talk. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.